Well, last week we saw something happen in the story of Esther, and it was something that was quite unusual. If we can take the lights down. It was something quite unusual, something quite peculiar. Taking you back to, to the story, we know Mordecai, he drafts a document, right? Bears the king's name, bears the king's seal. This document is sent out throughout the entire kingdom, right? The document sent on the entire kingdom. No one is to be excluded. This document is actually translated into every language under heaven to ensure that the people would read and understand, to ensure that the people, what they heard in regard to the king's message, they knew exactly what was being said. And what did we discover last week in regard to this document? What we discovered is the premise of the document, the thrust of it, the whole point of it, was to declare salvation to the Jewish people. That's the point. To declare destruction to their enemies. Whole point of the document. Well, now, while that might not seem peculiar or unusual, the impact, the response of the inhabitants to that document is absolutely peculiar. It is absolutely unusual. And how did they respond? Well, we read this at the end of verse 17 in chapter 8, and this is what we read. Then many of the people of the land became Jews. This is the impact. They became Jews. It was so powerful with the contents of what these, what these Gentiles heard in this document, what had come to their ears, what they had seen with their eyes, was so overcoming, so overwhelming, so fearful. Think about this. It was so much fear that it promoted them. It moved them to become Jewish. That is an awesome thing. See, they didn't want to die. They wanted life. They wanted salvation that was given to the Jewish people. You know, I think it goes without saying, these particular Gentiles who responded this way, who ended up becoming Jews, can we just say it? These are the smart ones of the kingdom. These are the intelligent ones, all right, who saw something in the document. This was about self-preservation. It was a no-brainer to them. Time to become Jews. That's what it was. It was time to become Jews. Well, isn't that fascinating? Because we find that with the gospel of Yeshua literally going out to the four corners of the globe, the Bible being translated into literally every language under heaven, that gospel has had the very same effect that we read the document in Esther has made upon the Gentiles in King Ahasuerus' kingdom. Absolutely amazing. But as I mentioned last week, unfortunately, Satan has come in. And he does what he does best. He's sown seeds of division. He's introduced distortions of truth. He's introduced doctrines and theologies that are completely foreign to our scriptures today. And the horrifying part is the church is devouring them. Hook, line, and sinker. So in light of this, in light of the importance of this topic, I want to spend a little more time today uh, picking up where we left off, talking about the reality of what it should look like when Gentiles come into faith in the Messiah Yeshua. What should that final product look like? Do they become as Jews? Or do they become something else? Do they set up a separate church with different theologies? Well, let's continue to look at this. And I'm going to take you to the second, um, or I'm going to take you to the second chapter in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. Now, this epistle is written to the Gentiles, and this is going to be made clear as we go through. But what you're going to see here is Paul does an amazing job of articulating the power of Yeshua and exactly what was accomplished on the cross. And, then, and that effect that it would have on the Gentiles, the reality of that effect, what it should look like. So let's take a peek at this in chapter 2, verse 11. Therefore remember that you... Once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. Now, something needs to be said here. There are two people, two kinds of people on this earth. It's really simple. There are Jews and those who are not Jews. It's that simple. If 
bottom line. Another way to state that is there are the circumcision and there is the uncircumcision. Two distinct groups of people. And what Paul is saying here when he says who are called uncircumcision, he's referring to the Gentiles by what is called the circumcision. In other words, Jews have always gone out and made the distinction, you are a Gentile. All throughout the ages. That's, that's something that is inherent to a Jewish person. It's to make the distinction, it's to identify. You're of the uncircumcised. Think about this, when David... King David, not yet made king at this point, but well on his way. King David, he goes forth and he hears the arrogance of the Philistines. He hears the arrogant mouth totting off of Goliath. And he comes to his brethren, and what does he say? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? How dare he defy the Israel of God, the, enemy, the, the armies of Israel. You look at what he did. He comes out and identifies who is this uncircumcised Philistine. In other words, the proclamation, you are not one of us. You are our adversary. You are not of our kingdom. You are not of Israel. Salvation has not been provided for you. Death and destruction wait at your door. And ironically enough, that's exactly what happened to Goliath. It was death and destruction. And this is the weight, this is the statement that Paul is making here. The Jewish people have always made that distinction. They've always identified the Gentiles as being Gentiles. Now, moving on to verse 12. That at that time you were without Mashiach, being aliens from the commonwealth, politia in the Greek. This commonwealth that Paul's referring to is citizenship. And what he's saying is, is you had no rights in Israel. You had no privileges. You had no citizenship. You know, the, the, the point of being a citizen in, in a country like America is to have the protection of the government, to have the benefits, the blessings that the government uh, gives you. If you are a citizen, and if you're not a citizen, you don't get the same rights. You don't get the same protections. This is what Paul's getting at. You are aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and he goes on, in strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Let me tell you something. Commit this passage to memory. Because when someone asks you, what does it mean to be a Gentile? This is it. Paul just defined what it means to be a Gentile. All of these statements, it's without Mashiach. It's, it's, it's not being a citizen of Israel. It's being a foreigner to the covenants of promise. It's having no hope and it's without God. That's what it means to be a Gentile. You know, anything of any value that has been given in this age, anything of any spiritual value, it has been given to Israel. It has been given to the people of God, period. Make no mistake. To them, it's the promises. To them, it's the blessings. To them, it's the forgiveness of sins. To them, it's salvation. Now, if you're a Gentile, I know what you're thinking, well, Daniel, this isn't a great start to a message. Uh, if I'm a Gentile, this doesn't sound really good for me. It sounds like I'm completely cut off. Well, fortunately, Paul doesn't end here. He has more to say. And this is what he continues to say in verse 13. But now, okay, things were one way, but things have changed. But now there's a change. In Messiah Yeshua, you who once were afar off have been brought near. How? By the blood of of Mashiach. By the blood of Mashiach we've been brought near. For he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Notice here the Apostle Paul, he explicitly he explicitly identifies there was a middle wall. There was a middle wall established separating the uncircumcised from the circumcised. The Jew from the Gentile. And let me tell you something. Go through, read the Torah, and you will find this to be true. The Torah distinguishes between the two. The Torah divides the Gentile from the Jew over and over and over again. Just read it. But with the coming of Yeshua, something supernatural happened. This, this, this dividing wall, the fortified wall of separation, this fortified wall was knocked down. Now, to help you appreciate 
what Paul is actually conveying here, I want to share a story with you. Uh, recently, I attended a, a rally in support of Israel, and I, I think some, at least some of you were actually there. But for those of you who were not there, um, it was a really cool event. It was pretty amazing. I brought my whole family. And uh, the keynote speaker was actually a living Holocaust member. And I'm going to tell you something, just, just as believers in Yeshua, if you haven't heard a testimony from a living Holocaust survivor, you are missing out. This is something that needs to go to the top of your list to hear the atrocities that they went through, to hear what they endured, to hear what their own eyes saw, and to hear the fact that I, I, I wasn't even aware that human beings could be so vile. Such evil, such pure evil, such pure wickedness. It's really an eye-opener. Well, in addition to her, this keynote speaker, who, who was just gripping her testimony, there were other guest speakers at this event. Ironically enough, one of them was a German. He's a third-generation German from a particular family that his family has went out generation after generation, and what they have done, they have been openly coming out against uh, fascist regimes such as uh, that of the Nazi regime. They've been coming out against totalitarian governments, Marxist-Lenin ideology. They've been coming out generation after generation speaking against them because of how the atrocities that are committed with these governments, with these types of regimes. Well, in the midst of his presentation, he said something. It was something that, all, like that, you could have turned a light switch, it caught me attention. He drew me in. He started talking about post-World War II. He started talking about something known as the Berlin Wall. And this really caught my attention. Now, we're going to do a little history lesson today. For those of you who are not familiar with history, World War II ended in the mid-1940s, but like all wars, it really never ended. And what happened with the fall of Germany, you had all these foreign troops that entered into the land of Germany and began to occupy. They didn't just up and leave once Hitler fell, once the Nazi regime fell. They didn't just leave land. They actually dug in their heels. And so here you have all these uh, various groups. And right here you have the French sector, the British sector, and the American sector all on the west side of what we would call Berlin. Berlin's quite large. And what's interesting is these, these are all military presences, okay? But look at the east side. On the east side, you have the Soviet Union, and they had a massive, massive presence in Germany. Now, what's interesting about this, post-World War II, for those of you who are from that generation, you come from that generation, you know something, the war didn't end, something else happened, another war began, what is called the era of the Cold War right? The era of the Cold War. And here's, here's what's interesting, is that should have been expected. When you have different militaries, different countries coming together to fight against Nazi Germany to make it fall, um, these things can always be good. However, you're asking for trouble if their ideologies conflict. Now let me just tell you, the West Side, the French, the British, and American, these all stood for democracy, for freedom of society, for liberty, for prosperity, for, for citizens' rights. This was their ideology. On the east side, you have the Soviet Union, the exact opposite ideology, Marxist-Lenin ideology. There is no freedom, there is no liberty, you as a person can own anything, Everything you own belongs to the state, therefore there's no prosperity, there is only oppression. It was only a matter of time before we had a crisis. Because these two ideologies are diametrically opposed to one another. There was only a matter of time before crisis erupted, and that's what happened, the Berlin crisis, as they call it. And what ended up happening on one particular day, August 13th, it was a Sunday morning, 1961, the Soviet side, the Soviet troops, tanks, guards, they went in and they blocked off all the entrances and exits from East Berlin going into West Berlin. They cut them off one day. 
understand something. That day was the last day that many of them um, on the east side, the Germans that lived on the east side, that was the last day they saw their family members. They, they, if they worked in Westberlin, immediately lost their job. Something happened. They cut it off. They started establishing themselves. We had the Berlin crisis. And out of this crisis, they began to build what is known as the Berlin Wall. Now here's what's interesting about this. It's a multi-layered, really, security system. Barbed wire fence, a place called the Death Zone, with sand that they could see footprints lined with mines. They had something known as these anti-vehicle trenches, as, as pictured here, that they had before the wall, preventing anyone from going and, and, and getting to the concrete wall. They had over 300 watchtowers that were erected. They had over 250 guard dog patrols going. Now, when I start mentioning things like guard guard dog patrols, when I start mentioning, uh, mentioning uh, things like barbed wire fencing, and then a concrete wall that spans longer than your eye can see, longer than the curvature of the earth, which I think is like 26 miles, longer than that, they have this massive thing. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like maximum security prison to me. All the pictures you've ever seen of a maximum security prison actually happen to divide Berlin east from the west and eventually just dividing Germany with two different ideologies. Now here's what's really fascinating, and this does come into play with where I'm going with this. The Soviet Union was doing what they did best, Marxist-Lenin ideology, they're experts at propaganda. They were going around telling the people, we need to erect this wall, we need to build this wall, we need to divide it because we've got to protect you. We've got to protect you from the fascists. The fascists are going to get us. All the while, you look at the construct of, of the actual wall itself, the whole thing was creating a prison to lock the people in. That was its entire design. This massive wall. Anyone that tried to escape was shot on sight. You had all these people on the east side prevented. They could not get to the west side. They couldn't see their family anymore. And on the east side, what happened? Total despair. There was no hope. Total oppression. Pillaging. Being pillaged by the Soviet Union. Being put to death. People were starving. This is one of the, one of the great things about Marxist-Lenin ideology is they like to starve their people. It was total hell on the east side. And the only thing dividing them from freedom, from liberty, from hope, from prosperity, one thing, the wall. The Berlin Wall. And I'm telling you guys, this is exactly, this is an analogy to help you understand what Paul is trying to convey here. Think of the Gentiles being stuck on the east side. And there was no way to get to the Jewish side. What was dividing on the Jewish side, what was preventing them from getting to hope, from prosperity from salvation, was the wall. And this is exactly what Paul is conveying. But what's interesting, on November 9th, 1989, something happened. The Berlin Wall was, was actually um, set up to be destroyed. It was commissioned that that wall was to come down. You have the famous words of Ronald Reagan, tear that wall down, Mr. Gorbachev. You, you, you look at these things. If you watch the videos, you can watch this on YouTube, it will blow your mind. The people, the minute that wall came down, the people took to the streets, they went to the top of the wall, and they were singing and rejoicing. They were weeping with tears of joy because of the oppression, almost three decades of total oppression, of total despair, no hope, being treated like garbage. And in one day, that wall was taken down, and they experienced prosperity. They experienced liberty. They experienced freedom. Almost 2,000 years ago, on a much greater level, Yeshua has done the exact same thing for us. He took down that wall. What was preventing us, what Torah prevented, all the things that we see in Torah dividing the Jew from the Gentile, that wall was taken down. That is pretty amazing. Amen? 
Moving on to verse 15. Paul goes on to say, I just want to give you some perspective so you can feel the weight of what Paul is truly intending here. Having abolished in his flesh, meaning Yeshua, his sacrifice, the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Do you see it here where it says he created two new men from the two? You don't see he created two new men from the two. It says one new man from the two. In other words, there's no hint of dual covenant theology here. It's not even a fragment, a shred that we could even try to distort that, oh, well, this is clear. The Gentiles are supposed to set up a new, a new deal, a new church, separate from the Jews. There's no hint of replacement theology where, oh, here comes the Christian church. God did away with the Jews. They had their chance. Now it's the Christian church. We'll call ourselves the new Israel. That's garbage. It's from the pit of hell. Israel is Israel is Israel is Israel. It has never gone anywhere, and it never will. God has made the promise. Is God holy? Is God just? Is his words, when they leave his mouth, do they come back to him void? They do not. But here we see one new man from the two, and then therefore there is peace rather than enmity, rather than animosity. There's something that Paul states here in this passage that we do need to spend a little bit of time on simply for the sake of clarity. And that is what Paul says right at the front end. I want to reread this with you and I'm going to underline it for you. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Now, unfortunately, this is, this is one of the verses that has been presented to me on it many times to show me, to educate me, to, to, I guess, bring me to reality that Yeshua has abolished the law. This is, this is one of the verses that they, you know, they will use to purport. Yeshua has done away with the law. The Apostle Paul said so. It's abundantly clear. I mean, you can't get away from it. He abolished in his flesh, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances. I mean, it seems pretty clear. The question is, okay, well, let's ask. Is Paul actually stating that Torah, that the law is done away with here? Has he abolished it? You have to ask the question. Well, if you know me, if you've been with me, you know what I'm going to answer. No, he has not. But that doesn't end it. You can't just simply say no, because now you've got to ask the question, what is Paul talking about? If what he's saying is, okay, the law isn't done away with, the Torah isn't done away with, please you know, impart to me some wisdom, what is he saying? So, I want to talk about this. I want to dig into this so you understand exactly what Paul is going on here. I think you're going to appreciate it. The first thing that needs to be established is the subject. What is the premise of the entire passage as we get into chapter 2? What's the whole focus? What is Paul emphasizing? He's emphasizing the tearing down of the middle wall. That is his emphasis, to tear down the middle wall in Yeshua's great work and the fact that he was responsible for this. In addition to that, did you know that there are ordinances, okay, within Torah that locked out the Gentile, that locked out the the Gentiles from the blessings, from the promises, that prevented them from being united with the Jew? It's in Torah. And... These ordinances were created for a reason. They come from the mind of God. They don't come from the mind of Moses. The children of Israel were to be completely holy. There was to be no leaven or corruption within them. And so divisions were made. Well, I want to take you to the Torah because this is going to come into play and this is really going to help you on on even a deeper level than the Berlin Wall analogy. It's going to help you on a deeper level understand exactly what Paul is getting at. In Deuteronomy 23, verse 19, we read the following. You shall not charge interest to your brother. Okay, what he's referring to your fellow Jewish brethren. Interest on money or food or anything that is lent out at interest to a foreigner. This distinction is made. Here's the wall. To a foreigner, you may charge interest. But to your brother, you shall not charge interest. That the Lord your God may bless you in all to which you set your hand in the land which you are entering to possess. Isn't that fascinating? Total division, total wall of separation. If I'm a Jew, I can't charge interest to my fellow Jew. Oh, but if you're a foreigner, 
I can charge you all the interest I want. Do you see the division, the, the dividing wall? The Gentile did not get the blessing that the fellow Jew got. Let me take you further in uh, going back to Leviticus twenty two twenty four. You shall not offer to the Lord what is bruised or crushed or torn or cut, nor shall you make an offering of them in your land, nor from a foreigner's hand shall you offer any of these as the bread of your God, because their corruption is in them and defects are in them. They shall not be accepted on your behalf. Dividing wall. You can accept sacrifices or animals from your brethren. And this was natural, even if your tithe was too much, you went to Yerushalayim, you got sheep there to sacrifice, or bulls, or whatever you were going to sacrifice, you got them from your brethren. But if a foreigner was there and selling you animals, you could not buy it. Why? There was a middle wall of separation. A middle wall of separation. This is over and over again. We're seeing this. Deuteronomy 14, 21. You shall not eat anything that dies of itself. You may give it to the alien. Okay? This is alien or stranger, sometimes translated as stranger, who is within your gates that he may eat it or that you may sell it to a foreigner. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Isn't that amazing? Jewish people can't eat anything that dies of itself. Oh, but I can toss it to the dogs. I mean, this is... This is literally what's being said here. You can throw it to the dogs, but you yourself are holy. There's a middle wall of separation. There's a distinction over and over and over again in Torah, separating the Gentile from the Jew. Let me show you one more. Exodus 12, 43. And the Lord said to Moshe and Aharon, This is the ordinance of the Pesach. No foreigner shall eat it. Period. You want to talk about the middle wall of separation. No foreigner can eat it. A Jew can eat it. Those of the circumcision can eat it. But the Gentile cannot. So when Paul makes the statement, But now in Messiah Yeshua, you who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Mashiach, for he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity... That is the law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Paul is referring to all those ordinances that we just covered that separated the Jew from the Gentile. We now find that through the death of Yeshua, Gentiles are supernaturally, something spiritual, something supernatural took place. They're joined with Israel because the wall has been broken down. The two have finally become one man, set apart to worship for the purpose of being holy, to worship the God of Israel. So the long and the short of it is, Paul is not stating that Torah is abolished. He's not stating that the law of God is done away with. He's simply telling us the middle wall has been abolished. Those commandments contained in ordinances that kept the Jew and Gentile apart, those have been torn down. Let me give you further evidence of this that this is exactly what Paul is speaking and that I'm not reading into the text. You're going to see this. Pay very close attention. Paul goes on to say in in verse 16 that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off, meaning the Gentiles, and to those who were near, meaning Israel. They've always been near to God. He's dwelt in the midst of their camp. Moving on to verse 18. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Now pay attention, because all those terminologies that we found in passage after passage within the Torah, of the foreigners and strangers and aliens, pay close attention to what Paul says now. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. The very terms we find being used in Torah that separated the Jew from the Gentile, that made the distinction, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That is massively epic. That's the tearing down of the middle wall. That is Gentiles becoming as Jews. Just as we see happening in the story of Esther. Where the Gentiles, they read this document and they're compelled. And the only answer for them, self-preservation, become Jews. 
That's the answer. And you want to see just how awesome, just how spiritual uh, this work that Yeshua accomplished really was. Look at what Paul says next. In verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Yeshua HaMashiach himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. This is God's dwelling place. What is the temple? It's God's dwelling place. In whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. I mean, this is how awesome and how spiritual the work of Yeshua really is to the point that we find both Jew and Gentile, they're coming together to create something awesome. The dwelling place of the living God. So when we read in Esther 8.17, then many of the people of the land became Jews. Understand, this passage, it's not just history. It's much more than that. This passage was foretelling of a future event, the mystery, where the mystery of God is literally be unfolding in the midst and baffle and confound the minds, even the minds of his own people, as we read in the book of Acts. They were confounded, they were amazed, they were bewildered that the anointing of the Ruach HaKodesh would fall down upon the uncircumcised, the very ones they have kept their entire generation after generation has separated from. You just think about that. It is amazing. But nowhere will you find in Scripture, either through ancient stories like that of Esther uh, or, or that of, of others that we find in the Tanakh, you won't find anything in the New Testament anywhere where the Gentiles have come to establish their own doctrine their own place of habitation, their own churches that are literally being guided by their own books, their own books, rather than how the Jewish people have been guided for thousands of years. You just don't see that anywhere. The only thing we find time and time again in Scripture is Gentiles becoming Jews. You can't find anything else. That's what's there. That's the testimony that has been given for us. And guess what? Esther isn't the only story. Esther is not the only story leaving us a testimony. There are others in the Tanakh, such as the book of Ruth. You think about Ruth, this should be fresh in your mind. We just covered it on Shavuot. Henry did a a really good message on that. Well, what happened in the book of Ruth? Well, condensed version, you know, Naomi and Elimelech, her husband, they go out from the land of Israel, they go into the land of Moab with their two sons, Machlon and Chilion, and eventually, the, the sons take wives for the women of Moab. Jewish men taking wives from the women of Moab. Gentiles. These are Gentiles. Machlon married Ruth and Chilion. Uh, uh, he married Orpah. Over time, something happened. Her husband, Elimelech, he dies. Later on, years later, her sons die. So there's Naomi left with her two daughters-in-law. Okay? And what does she tell him to do? Well, let's just look at this briefly. Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Verse 14. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. This is what Orpah did. Orpah left. Orpah abandoned. You know, and there's really imagery here going on of the whole Gentiles, all the Gentiles coming in, to the tree of Israel, but some of them turning back. Orpah is representative of that. Orpah returned to her idols, to her gods, and to her people. To do that, she had to do something. She had to leave the Jewish people, and she had to leave the God of Israel. But Ruth was different. Ruth was unique in verse 16. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or turn back from following after you for what wherever you go, 
I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. It doesn't say, well, my people, I'll hang with my people, but I'll have your God. Because this is, this is what's being espoused today. This is actually what we're seeing a lot of today. Well, your people aren't my people, but I'll, I'll claim your God. I'll serve the God of Israel. This is mind-blowing. Ruth says one thing. Your people, the Jewish people, are going to be my people. This is the answer for Gentiles that are coming into the faith through faith in the Messiah Yeshua, the king of the Jews, the master of the Jewish people. Okay, There's one response. Your Jewish people shall be my people and your God my God. It's a total abandonment of the world, of the world systems, a total abandonment of everything that is Gentile, that is uncircumcised, that is unclean. For that which is holy, for that which is clean, for that which was given to the Jewish people. Again, I tell you, we are left with testimony after testimony in the Tanakh, showing the mystery of God that would unfold and exactly how Gentiles were supposed to respond to the gospel. This is how we're supposed to respond. We're to cling to them. You think of our, our, our tagline, Zechariah 8.23. Zechariah 8.23, you have... Ten men from every nation grabbing on to the Jew, not letting go. Well, what does that sound like? It sounds like Ruth not letting go of Naomi. She's clinging on to her. We're seeing the same imagery. Again, same stories being told, the same story being told over and over again, different characters, different generations. I mean, we've got to pick up on this stuff. If we're studying the Word, you will see it. Your eyes will open. Scales will start to come off your eyes. It is awesome. The same story being told over and over. Different characters. And these men in, in Zechariah 23, they're clinging on. Let us go with you. It doesn't say, you wait there, Jew. We have, a, we have a nice green pasture over here. And we'll talk to you when we get a chance. They cling on to them. They're clinging on to the commandments of God. They're holding on to the zitzit. Let us go with you. For we have heard that God is with you. That is what God has for those Gentiles who are coming to confess his name. To confess the name of Yeshua. Do not be deceived. We, the church cannot replace Israel. And we have not been set up to set up a new church. Or a separate church. I mean, this is one of the things. We, we now call these things churches all over. They should be synagogues. We've entered into a Jewish faith. I want to jump ahead to chapter 2. Because this, this absolutely gets amazing. I wish I could spend more time here. But I'm not going to today. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now keep in mind, Boaz, this man who enters the story, he's representative of Yeshua. Again, you can't make this stuff up, okay? You can't make it up. Boaz is representative of Yeshua, and listen to what he says to Ruth, his representative of the Gentiles who would be grafted into Israel. He says to her, you will listen, my daughter, will you not? It's the first thing that we see, that he says to her, is absolutely amazing. You will listen to me, will you not? Are these not the words of Yeshua to us when we go to confess his name? It says in John chapter 10, the sheep hear his voice and they follow him. We are to follow his voice. We are to follow his leading. And what's he command? This is where you, you want to see what is incumbent upon the Gentiles. Pay attention. Do not go to glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close to my young women. Does this sound like go set up in another field? Be separate from my people. Because that's what it's representative. My women is representative of his people. These are Boaz's people. These are Yeshua's people. These are the Jewish people. No, no. You are not to go in another field. Stay close by my young women. Going on to verse 9. Let your eyes be on the field. In other words, never take your eyes off of the field. You never take your eyes off the commandments of God. You never take your eyes off of Yeshua. Never take your eyes off the gospel, the field of the gospel. Never do it. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? Talking about coming under the protection and the shadow of the wing. Exactly what we see happening in our story in Esther. 
that all these Gentiles throughout the kingdom, what do they want? They want to come under the protection that is afforded to the Jewish people. They want victory. They want salvation. And so he says here, this is, this is what it's afforded in this representation of Ruth and Gentiles coming in. And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Isn't that amazing? They're going to draw what? Mayim Chaim. Going to draw living water to make them live, to be sustained. This is a picture of the anointing of the Ruach HaKodesh, what we actually see being fulfilled in the book of Acts, falling down upon the Gentiles. Cannot make this stuff up. And then we go on in verse 10. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, and this is amazing, you will listen to my voice, will you not? This is what Boaz says to Ruth. And he, he goes through this, and what is the response when she hears the voice of God? She falls down on her face. That is the response we should have when we're coming before Yeshua. Fall down on your face before the king. Amen? And so she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes, that you should take notice of me, since I am, oh, there's that term again, a foreigner. Why would you notice me a foreigner? Someone who's cut off from his people. Now this is where it gets really good. Listen to why he notices her. This is something you're going to want to take to heart because this is salvational. This is what will get you an internal inheritance. And this is what he says in verse 11. Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law Naomi was a Jew. All your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth. She abandoned everything that she was accustomed to to be drawn to the Jewish people, to the people of God. She, let, she, she, she took nothing with her. You want to learn something about what it takes to follow Yeshua? Take up your cross and follow Him? Anyone who loves his life is going to lose it. And if you lose your life, this, we're seeing this right here, you lose your life, you will gain it. How you have left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. Isn't that amazing? Because all throughout the Torah, prior to the coming of Yeshua, the Gentiles were totally foreign. Uh, their understanding and their knowledge of the Jewish people, by and large. There's maybe a couple, some would argue there's a couple proselytes. By and large, they're totally cut off. And they had no clue what was going on. Can you say a middle wall of separation? I mean, that's what this is. Going on to verse 12. The Lord, this is Boaz saying to Ruth. These are the words we want to hear. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel. Under whose wings you have come for refuge. It's the whole point. She knew. She knew something in her heart of hearts to come under the refuge, to come under the protection of the God of Israel. You take this back to the story of Esther. There's Gentiles throughout the kingdom of Ahasuerus who decided to come, uh, become Jews. They came under the wing of the God of Israel under his protection. I shudder to even ask the question I'm about to ask. But I'm going to. What in the world has happened to the faith? What has happened to the church? Why is it that the Jewish Sabbath is foreign to people who profess Jesus as Lord? A Jew, King of the Jews, Master of the Jewish people. Why is it that these, these biblical dietary laws are all but offensive it's actually repulsive to the people. Why is it that the holidays of God are completely foreign? No idea what they are. I'll tell you. They did what Orpah did. They did what Ruth was commanded not to do. They left the field. And they sought to establish their own tree. A, a, a tree that is foreign to that of Israel. And out of their departure, all sorts of heresies are now running amok. Everything from anti-Semitism to a complete disconnect from God's law. 
from God's Torah. Syncretism, I can tell you this, and I know you know this to be true, syncretism is plaguing the church. There's as much paganism in the church today as there is in paganism. It's insane. If we truly are living lives according to God's will, if we're living lives according to His intent for us, His plan, representative of what I read in the Scriptures, what I read in the story of Ruth, what I read in the story of Esther, people should be asking you, what are you, Jewish? If you're living what this book says, they should be asking you, what are you, Jewish? You go to the park, and, they, and you have a nice little gathering with your family, maybe. And they get the long picnic tables with all the food, and you're picking through, and you're asking, is this pork? And they're asking you, what, are you Jewish? Your answer is yes. The answer is yes. In your heart, you are Jewish. You are called to that which was given to the Jewish people. You think of the Sabbath as you go about your way. Your employer says, well, I've got to have you come in this Saturday. Well, well I can't. Well, why not? Well, it's, it's, it's a religious observance for me. And, and your boss just happens to be a Christian. Really? What are you, Jewish? Yes, I'm Jewish. There's your answer. This is good for us to go through this. You, you think about the festivals and you talk to, I mean, I have, <laughs> I've had conversations with pastors who are supposed to be shepherds of the church to talk to them a Passover and, or to invite them to Passover and they look at me like I got lobsters coming out of my ears. What? Passover? What are you, Jewish? Yes! Yes, I'm Jewish. If, 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 if we are walking, this is the point I'm telling you. There should barely be a week that goes by that you don't have somebody asking you why you do what you do because you're following God's commandments. They should be asking you, what are you, Jewish? And let me tell you something. If people are not going around asking, what are you, Jewish? You need to look in the mirror and say, what am I, Jewish? Am I Jewish or not? Because nobody's asking me. You should, you, then you need to go to the Scriptures and let the Scriptures expose you, expose your nakedness. Because are you, if you are living for a Jewish king, you will stick out like a sore thumb. All who seek to live godly in Messiah Yeshua will suffer persecution. And you better believe you're going to suffer persecution from professed believers. It's going to happen. Let me give you some more scriptural evidence as to Gentiles coming into the faith and what it was they were being called to. And I want to take you back to Galatians chapter 2, just more evidence to the fact that we're being called to live as Jews. Now, we looked at Galatians 2 previously. I didn't go all the way through the passage intentionally, but if you remember, Peter... He was separating himself from the Gentiles when prominent Jewish men were coming down from James. These prominent Jewish men were coming down, and uh, Peter saw him, and he was like, whoa, this is, I don't want any controversy, so he would separate himself from the Gentiles. Well, listen to how Paul handled this, and even Barnabas was doing this with Peter. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 14, this is the Apostle Paul, but when I saw that they, meaning Peter and Barnabas, when they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. And what does he mean, the truth of the gospel? The middle wall of separation has come down. That's the truth of the gospel. I said to Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? I want to point something out here. What was Peter doing? As he went out, as he sat with Gentiles and spoke of Yeshua with these Gentiles. He's doing exactly what Paul just said here. He was teaching them to live as Jews. You catch that? But Paul's upset because Peter's not living like a Jew. The whole point of a Jew is to adhere to the truth of the gospel. The Jewish people are to be a light. And they are a light. But this was what he was supposed to be and this is what Paul is bringing out. He's saying, you're supposed to be adhering to the truth of the gospel. And if you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles, which means ungodly, you're not acknowledging the truth, and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? In other words, you're being hypocritical. Your actions are contradicting what you know to be true. And this is what went out 
This was the first century. First century Jewish apostles going out. They were not going out and setting up a different church for the Gentiles. They were teaching them how to live for God. That's what they were teaching them. Let me give you another example and just show you how amazing this really is. I want to take you to Leviticus. I want to take you to the Torah. And this is what it says. I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And first thing I want to be very clear about, this is explicitly and only to God's Jewish people, to Israel. This statement, it's only to Israel. I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I'm going to say it again. I will walk among you, or I will dwell among you, and be your God, and you shall be my people. Look at what the Apostle Paul says to the Gentiles. Not to, not to his fellow Jews. He's speaking the following to Gentiles. Look at what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15. What accord has Mashiach with uh, Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Notice, he's drawing a distinction here. Unbelievers have no part with believers. Isn't that interesting? This is a very similar distinction to that, all that I read throughout Torah, separating the Jew from the Gentile. But now he's utilizing terms of believer with unbeliever. And what argument has the temple, uh, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? You are the temple of the living God. As God has said, he goes to quote Leviticus 26, stated only of the Jewish people. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Cannot make this up. He's literally saying this to Gentiles, something that is explicitly for the Jewish people, quoted in Torah. Moving on to verse 17, he goes on to do it again. He does something extremely brilliant here. Therefore come out from among them and be separate. What does this sound like? sounds pretty Jewish to me. The whole establishment of the faith is to go out and to be separate from the world. And here, he goes, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Interesting, he's quoting Yeshayahu, he's quoting Isaiah 52, 11 here. Do you know that? Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. Paul is speaking to Gentiles, quoting prophet Isaiah, something that was quoted directly to Israel, to the Jewish people, and he's speaking it to Gentile believers. That is amazing, and then calls them sons and daughters. And what's pretty spectacular about this, did you notice what Paul did? He took the entirety of the scriptures. The first one he quoted was the Torah, and then he quoted from the prophets. The complete entity. Absolutely amazing. He is a brilliant masterful teacher, and the only way to describe him is he's anointed. When you come across this kind of teaching, there's only one description. The Apostle Paul was anointed of the Ruach HaKodesh. I'm going to give you one more example, and then we're going to close. And this one is intense. Exodus 19.5, a passage we've covered. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, again, speaking to the Jewish people, his people that were standing at the mountain. If you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people for all the earth that is mine. Same thing is said in Deuteronomy 26. Today you have proclaimed the Lord to be your God. There's confession. That's part of the covenant. You didn't come in the covenant unless you confessed him. And that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes, his commandments, and his judgments. And that you will obey his voice. Also today the Lord has proclaimed to you to be his special people. These are the words that he spoke to the Jewish people. Proclaim you to be his special people. His special people. Over and over. Just as he promised you that you should keep all his commandments. Now let me take you to Paul's Epistle to Titus, a Gentile, explicitly mentioned as a Gentile. And listen to the words that he speaks to him. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, isn't that interesting? Anyone who understands and appreciates the grace of the living God, they're taught something. 
They should be taught something. To deny ungodliness and worldly lust, they run away from sin. Torahlessness. They run away from it. And we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. How do we know what is righteous and what isn't righteous? It's the Torah. Amen? Looking for the blessed hope and uh, glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, now pay close attention to what he says to Titus, a Gentile. This is what he says in verse 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. The exact same words that are spoken of Torah to God's people, to God's Jewish people, Paul is quoting to a Gentile who has confessed and given his life to Yeshua. His own special people. Somebody please tell me how this equates to Jews and Gentiles are not in the same camp. Because everywhere I go in Scripture, from Tanakh all the way into the end of the Brit Hadashah, I can't find only but one testimony. The Gentiles becoming as Jews over and over again. It just doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It's fiction. It's heresy. The enemy has come in to divide us. Don't give in to it. Equip yourself in the word. Protect your own souls. Amen? We're going to close in prayer. Father God, we just come to you in the mighty name of your Son, the, the name above all names, a name, uh, there's no other name by which we must be saved but the name of Yeshua. Lord Yeshua, we, we, we give you praise, we give you glory, we thank you for breaking down the middle wall of separation. We don't deserve, as Ruth said to Boaz, why would you even look upon us? We are not worthy that you should. But while we were still yet sinners, you died for us. What an awesome story. May we live lives worthy of your name in every way. May our speech be conducive to your word. May the things that come out of our mouths bring glory to who you are. Lord, we, we pray for the, your Holy Spirit. You, you said you'd go away. You would give of your Holy Spirit. And you would manifest yourself to us. We, that's intimacy. That's relationship. Lord, we crave relationship. We crave intimacy with the King of Israel, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Because apart from you, we can do nothing. And uh, Lord, we just give you praise and glory. And, and we can't possibly thank you enough for the sacrifice that you made. But may our actions walk out in holiness and testify of that sacrifice in nobility. Uh, just give you praise and glory in the mighty name of Yeshua, we pray. Amen.